I remember watching a variety show when I was a boy, sitting in the family room of our home. And as I watched a particular musical artist sing and listened to the song that he was singing, I was impressed how he could not only sing but play the piano being blind. Now, I know that blind people can easily sing uh, like the rest of us, though they perhaps may not know the, the lyrics and they have to learn them. Uh, but to play the piano, how impressive that someone who is blind can do that. And I remember my dad sitting there with me commenting on how this particular artist had such a good voice and how amazing it was that, that he could sing and play the piano and have all of this marvelous talent despite the fact that he was challenged with blindness. And I said to my dad, when my dad commented on how sad it is to see a man in that situation, blind, cannot see. I said, Dad, think about all the money he has. <laughs> dad said to me, he said, Son, I want to tell you something and don't ever forget it. That man would give everything he has just to be able to do what you and I can do, and that is see. To be able to see how precious is our sight and of all the wonderful gifts that God has given to the uh, human species, the ability to see, what a tremendous blessing that is. I mean, we pity those who cannot see. And every one of us could reach an age at some point where our sight is gone from us. I've already reached the point where I have to wear these because I can't see like I once did. Sight is is precious to us and we're compassionate toward the one who is blind or at least we should be. Our Lord Jesus was compassionate toward all men. You know if we pity someone who is uh, blind or someone who is deaf or someone who cannot walk or whatever the frailty may be, we pity that person and would do anything we could to help that person. Surely then Jesus is going to likewise be concerned about those whose health is not what it should be, who have debilitating diseases, or for whatever reason uh, have been hindered along life's way, not able to see, not able to hear. And he demonstrated throughout his time here upon this earth, especially during that three-year ministry, that he wanted to do something to alleviate a burden. Some of the burdens that Jesus uh, lifted were those burdens that had to do with one's health. Now we know why Jesus performed the miraculous. Jesus performed the miraculous because he would confirm that he was the Son of God. And uh, it's interesting that when Jesus performed the miraculous, he so often would use that as an opportunity to help somebody. Don't you find that interesting? And don't you think that speaks to the character of our Lord? If I'm going to perform the miraculous and confirm that I am who I claim to be, the very Son of God, then I'm going to do something to help somebody. I'm going to help somebody who can't walk be able to walk again. I'm going to help somebody who can't hear, hear again. I'm going to help somebody who's blind see again. Now in John the ninth chapter, we have recorded of Jesus healing a man who was born blind. Now there are several instances when our Lord healed blind people. But this is the only instance where we have our Lord healing someone who was blind from birth. This man had never seen the light of day. He'd never looked upon the faces of those who were most precious to him. He never had the opportunity of watching a sunrise or seeing a sunset. He never had the opportunity of observing green grass and uh, trees that were blossoming and flowers that were blooming. He never had that opportunity. He was blind from his birth. And so on a particular Sabbath day, Jesus is going to heal this blind man. Now, whenever you find our Lord getting ready to uh, teach and preach on a Sabbath day, expect that there's some challenge that's going to come along with that because he's going to, he's going to challenge the conventional mores, the tradition of men, uh, particularly concerning this day, the Sabbath day. And so on a particular Sabbath day, here is Jesus passing by a man blind from his birth. Jesus didn't just pass by and do nothing. Jesus just didn't, show indif didn't pass by and show indifference. 
Jesus would do something on this occasion to help this man and likewise continue to prove that he is the Son of God. But I want you to think for just a moment that on this particular Sabbath day, as Jesus observes this man, before he ever does anything, remember his disciples and their reaction? The disciples, according to verse 2 of John 9, asked Jesus, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, these are Jesus' disciples. They're close to him. They are those who sit in his school day after day. They are those who engage in ministry with him day after day. And yet, just like you and me who seek to follow Jesus, they get confused about things. There are some things they don't understand. There's some misteaching they've received along the way. And it was common that some would uh, suppose that a person who is suffering some kind of debilitating disease, or if a person is suffering from blindness or deafness, whatever it may be, that he must have done something wrong or his parents did something wrong, and now he's paying the price. Well, I come in contact with Christians like that, uh, having to undergo some particular health crisis, and I must have done something, you know, a long time ago that God wasn't pleased about, and so now I'm having to suffer in this way. Why, well, the very idea to charge God with such a... Uh, uh, thing happening to you when we live in a world that has been cursed by sin and therefore with sin comes sorrow. And sometimes as indicated here, good people, innocent people suffer. Do little children sometimes suffer? And they're innocent, aren't they? Don't little children sometimes have to suffer the consequences of the mistakes of other people? Here is a man who is blind and the disciples just assume he must be guilty of something wrong in his life or his parents must have done something wrong and therefore he's having to pay this penalty. He is blind. But Jesus sets the record straight. Sometimes our Lord just simply had to correct his disciples' thinking. Does our Lord still do that for you and me today when we become mixed up, when we're misguided? Yes, we take his word, we listen to what he says, and we have our thinking corrected. That's what they needed. And so Jesus says in verse 3, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. No, he didn't sin. Sometimes people are born what? Blind. Terrible. It's a tragedy. But sometimes that's what's going to happen. This is the world in which we live. It was not the God's desire that the child be born blind, but he was born blind. God loved the one that was born blind, but he was still born blind. Jesus says has nothing at all to do with his sins or the sins of his parents. So here is a man that's born blind. Jesus says, I'll tell you though, he didn't do anything wrong. That's not why he's blind. But I will tell you this, God's going to use this as a way to teach you something and to teach others something. He's going to use this as the perfect opportunity to display his power. You know, what's Jesus, you know what Jesus is going to do. You've read John chapter 9 before. Same thing that happened in John chapter 11. You remember when Lazarus died, Jesus says, let's go and let's go and be with him and be with the family. And, the, and Jesus said, he's sleeping. Well, that to his disciples sounded like a good thing. Jesus says, no, what I mean is he's dead. And he said, I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there. What's Jesus talking about? Jesus is saying, when I get there to Bethany, I'm going to do something that's going to be very, very convincing as to who I am, the Son of God. You see, I could go over there and do what I've already done. I could heal Lazarus, but Lazarus is dead. Now what are you going to do, Lord? I'm going to raise him from the dead. I'm going to keep on confirming that I am who I claim to be, the very Son of God, that not only can I heal all kinds of various diseases, I likewise can raise people from the dead. And Jesus in John 9, that's two chapters prior to the account of Lazarus, and raising him from the dead, Jesus sees an opportunity again to demonstrate his power and uh, help convict his disciples of who he is and not just his disciples but others who would witness this great event. Now, Jesus says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night cometh when no man can work. Jesus says, I have just a limited, limited time to get my job done. In fact, when some of us uh, consider our lives here upon earth, we may have uh, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years to serve. A man told me this morning over at Kirby Pines, he said, I've been a Christian for 80 years. He said, I was baptized when I was 13. He said, I'm 93 now. I said, I was baptized when I'm 13, but I'm only 50. I said, I've got a ways to catch up with you. But he's been serving a long time. Jesus had a three-year ministry, and then he'd die. 
and then he'd raise, be raised from the dead and go on to heaven to be with the Lord where he makes intercession for us now. But Jesus says, my time is limited. And while I'm here, I've got to take advantage of the opportunity. But listen to verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Wherever you find Jesus, you find light. You see, when you can observe the light, you can do what? You can see. Jesus says, as long as I'm in the world, there's light. I'll say this, as long as the influence of Christ Jesus is found in this world, there's still light, correct? It is when the influence of Jesus begins to wane that we say this world is getting darker and darker and darker and darker. Jesus says, I am the light. He'd already declared himself to be the light of the world in John 8. And now he says, I am the light of the world once again. He says, as long as I'm in the world, the world will have light. And so he's going to demonstrate what this means by physically healing somebody and then making the spiritual application. He says, if you believe indeed that I am the light, then you watch what I'm about to do. I can grant physical light to somebody just like I can grant spiritual light to somebody. Those of us who are living today don't need to be concerned so much about the Lord doing something to help our physical bodies, although there's nothing wrong if we can find proper treatment and help to increase our strength and help us on the path that leads to better health. By all means, do it. But our Lord is particularly concerned about the soul, isn't he? And he wants light to come to your soul and to mine. As a matter of fact, in John the ninth chapter, we'll see that there are some who, though they could see with their eyes, would not allow the light of truth to enter therein. But here's a man who is blind. And Jesus says, I'm going to show my disciples and anybody else who sees this event, witnesses what I'm about to do to know that indeed I bring light. So here is this man to whom he now turns his attention. Verse 5, when he'd thus spoken, Jesus spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. Now here is this man who is born blind and Jesus decides he's going to heal this man. What power is there in the mud and in the spittle that's placed upon his eyes? Not anything. Why did the Lord do that? I have no idea. But he did. And he told the man what he needed to do. This has to do with faith, doesn't it? Now Jesus says to the man, he says, you go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Now keep this in mind, not every time Jesus performed a miracle was faith required. But this time, for a man to receive the miracle, yes, he was going to have to demonstrate his faith. As a matter of fact, as you continue through John, the ninth chapter, you're going to see how Jesus is leading him all along toward faith in him. All right? He's trying his best, Jesus is, to convert this man. It's not going to be that difficult, however. Because here is a man who immediately goes and washes in the pool of Siloam. He's a little different from another man we read about in 2 Kings 5. You remember when Naaman was told what he could do to find a cure for his leprosy? He won't argue about it. Go wash in the river Jordan. Uh, first of all, he was offended because God's man Samuel didn't even come out and tell him. He sent somebody else. And go wash in Jordan? Aren't there better rivers around? Perhaps. But the Lord said go and wash in Jordan. And dip seven times. Why seven? Uh, because that's what the Lord said to do. Seven times in Jordan and you'll be cleansed. He finally humbled himself to the point where he did just exactly that and he was healed, wasn't he? Here's a man who didn't argue about it. Here is a man who really wants his sight restored, but he must have a great degree of humility. In fact, I think we'll see that he did. Here is a man who immediately goes and washes in the pool of Siloam and what did he receive? Just what the Lord promised. He received his sight. The Lord always keeps his word. He never does a lie. You want to see? Then here's what you need to do. And so the man demonstrated great faith. He goes and he washes in the pool of Siloam and he can now see. Now the scriptures do, do not say a whole lot right here about the joy that must have overwhelmed this man. But I want you to put yourself in his shoes just for a moment. Think about this just for a moment. Here he is blind since birth. Never been able to see anything glorious surrounding him. The very sight of the birds of the air, the very sight of green grass and flowering, uh, blossoming trees, and never been able to look upon the faces of those whom he loves and who has loved him in return. All of that now becomes...
clear. He can see. Sight has been given to this man who was blind since birth. Now that sent some shock waves through the community, didn't it? Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Why would he be begging after all? Because a man who was born blind was not given much of an opportunity, not during those particular days. Nobody really cared that much. He'd have to just sit and beg. Others would look upon him as being rather useless. Today, we have a different sense uh, uh, concerning those who face various kinds of handicaps and challenges, and we do all that we can to assist them and find ways where they can uh, be integrated into society and, and find worthwhile purpose in life. They have a lot to contribute, and we understand that, but not back then. And so it is that here is this man who is now going to be ostracized. People are interested. People are curious. What is it that's going on? Here's what amazes me as I study the ninth chapter of the book of John, that very few people could rejoice with what's happened. It's interesting to me when there's a religious connotation given that people have a hard time rejoicing. Let man do something on his own and receive praise for it then everybody wants to rejoice. But this was totally confounding. How did this happen? And this man is not going to be ashamed to tell who did this. Well, some asked the question, is this not the one who sat and begged? Others said, well, this is he. Some others said, well, he's like him. But he said, I'm the one. <laughs> Can't you hear the excitement in his voice? I'm the one. I'm the one that was blind. Now I can see. And so they asked the question, how were your eyes opened? This is mystifying. People can't understand it. Today, somebody could have some problem with his eyesight, and it's possible that an eye doctor, an optometrist, ophthalmologist, what have you, could help that individual. But here's a man who's been blind from his birth in first century Judea, and now all of a sudden he can see. How were your eyes opened? He said, let me tell you about him, right? Here is a man that is being converted to the Christ. He said, a man that's called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Well, that leads to curiosity, doesn't it? Where is this man? We want to see him so we can rejoice with you. I don't get any intention whatsoever of them wanting to rejoice with him. There are a group of people out there that like to keep something stirred. That seems to be these folks. Because what do they do? Let's go talk to the Pharisees about this. Let's go talk to the religious leaders of the day and see if they can figure this out. He said, a man called Jesus has anointed my eyes. He told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now I can see. They want to see him. He says, I don't know where he is. I know who did it. But I don't know where he is. In fact, this man didn't even know what Jesus looked like, did he? No, he received his sight after he went to the pool of Siloam. He doesn't even know what he looked like, but he knows the name Jesus. He no doubt had heard of Jesus. Here is a man likewise who's well known because people see him all the time. Have you ever heard of, of a beggar in a community? Sure you have. Is that beggar sometimes known, particularly if it's in a small town, uh, in a small community? Everybody knows who this is, wandering around the streets, and maybe every once in a while people try to give him a little help, but he has no real shelter, has no place to call home, has not a lot to eat, and so he sits around begging. They know this man. They've seen him regularly, and they know he's blind, but now all of a sudden he can see. Well, they brought him to the Pharisees, to the Pharisees, to the religious leaders of the day, who surely through kindness and compassion will rejoice that something good like this has happened. You ever want to see the heart of this religious group, the Pharisees? Just look at John 9. They are some of the most sour, indifferent individuals you'll ever find. They couldn't rejoice for anything. If you can't rejoice when a person receives his sight, having been born blind, you're about as hard as anybody I know. That's, just, that's callousness right there, isn't it? And yet they begin to question this man. Why? Oh, it was the Sabbath day. It was the Sabbath day. What's more important than the healing of a blind man? Oh, doing nothing on the Sabbath day. Jesus had to correct that thinking, right? We can have some of that even today. Brother or sister in Christ stops along 385 Expressway. It's about 915. 
a brother or a sister stops and says, what's wrong? Well, uh, something's going on underneath the hood there. The engine's messed up or maybe it's a flat tire or something like that. And somebody said, well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I'd help you, but I got to go to church first, all right? Now, you stay right here and let me go to church first and then we'll come back. At, well, I'm, a, I'm a, a sister in Christ. I'm here by myself. It's kind of dangerous. Too bad, right? Not staying. You know better. What's the right thing to do? The right thing to do is to stay and help a brother or sister who's in need to assist them getting to wherever they need to be, calling somebody to come and help. It's just the right thing to do. And not these Pharisees, not to these Pharisees. They didn't see it that way. Here are these Pharisees who say, uh, you mean this man did something on the Sabbath day? Uh, yes, he did. He healed a blind man. Oh, that's beside the point. He did some work on the Sabbath day. And so Jesus, who made the clay and opened his eyes, verse 14, did it on the Sabbath day. And so the Pharisees asked him again, how did you receive your sight? He said, well, he put clay upon mine eyes and I washed and do see. Does that make any sense? Uh -uh. You see, these Pharisees, like so many in the religious world and outside of it, if it doesn't make some kind of logical sense to them, then they will not believe it. What do you mean? There's nothing medicinal about putting clay and spit on eyes. Nothing about that's going to bring sight back to a man. And so he said, he put clay up on my eyes and, and, and I washed and I now see. And therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God. Why? Because uh, he keepeth not the Sabbath day. You see, they know Jesus. They know who he is. They're looking for ways they can condemn him. This man isn't of God because look what he did on the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? That's a good question, isn't it? And now there is a division between them. Some say, well, he couldn't have done this because you're not supposed to do any work on Sabbath day. He couldn't have come from God. I don't care if this is seen as an act of kindness. He wouldn't have done this if he's a man of God. But yes, but can, can anybody but a man of God do these kind of miracles? So they go to the blind man again. Don't you know this has to become frustrating? Said, what, uh, what do you say about this? Who opened your eyes? Do you believe he's a prophet? Well, indeed, he said he must be a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. We don't believe this. Well, they had seen him as much as anybody else had. They knew who this was. We don't believe you. We don't believe you just got your sight. Bring his parents before us. And so the parents come before these judges and they said, uh, is this your son who you say was born blind? How doth he now see? Now this parent's reaction is amazing to me. Remember, nobody's rejoicing. The people who first observed were mystified at what happened. They brought him to, to the Pharisees who can't get excited about it because uh, Jesus did it and we can't support anything Jesus did. And now the parents who ought to be jumping up and down with excitement uh, they say, we know that this is our son. We know that he is born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we don't know. Or who opened his eyes, we know not. He's of age. You ask him, he'll speak for himself. They know exactly. They knew exactly who did it. Because the very next text says, these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. They knew who he was. They knew that Jesus had healed their son, but out of fear... They said nothing. They said, you'll have to ask him. He's of age. We, we don't have anything to do with this. Is that not sad? I want to tell you something. I understand the fear that could be in the hearts of these Jews because of these religious leaders, the Pharisees. But I also think I know this. If I had a son that had been born blind and all of a sudden he could see, I'm going to shout it to the, to the, to, from the rooftops, here's the one who did it. You see him? He healed my son. My son that was blind, he now can see. It was Jesus. You can do whatever you want to to me. That's who did it. I'm going to give him the credit for it. I'm going to give him the praise. But they would not do it. And therefore said his parents, he's of age, you ask him. So they call him one more time. Now do you ever get frustrated? If you are, are if, if you have explained a situation to somebody and they keep coming back and they ask for more questions about it and you've explained them to the, to, to, you've explained the situation to them. You've made it as clear as possible. 
then doesn't that frustrate you when people keep asking you why? So they come to him again and they said, you give God the praise, but we know that this man is a sinner. <laughs> Whatever's happened to you, give the praise to God, but we know this man didn't do anything. I love his answer. It's classic. He said, whether he be a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. That's it. Okay, I don't know a whole lot about this man, but I'll tell you something. In his kindness and in his compassion and in great demonstration of power, he healed me. You see, common sense goes a long way, doesn't it? And this man has some good common sense. He just simply says, look, I can tell you this. I was blind, now I see. Why, has anybody ever heard of somebody who was born blind being able to see? Uh -uh. So, well, so, so whether or not this man is a man of God or not, I don't know. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. I'm going to tell you something, folks. You take the Scripture and a little bit of common sense and you'll defeat all the intellectuals of the world. You will. I think about the creation account versus this fanciful theory called the theory of evolution. You don't have to be that smart to defeat something like that. All the intellectuals think they've come up with an idea of how everything started. Why? They reject God. Same reason that these Pharisees could not give God glory for what had happened because to do so would be giving Christ the praise. They couldn't do it. Mm -mm. No, we cannot give Christ the praise for what's happened because he couldn't have done it. We don't like him. We don't accept him. Same way that the intellectuals are today about this theory of evolution. But remember, common sense alongside with Scripture Okay, then if you believe in the theory of evolution, for example, you're going to have to violate the law, of bio, the law of biogenesis, that life begets life. Life doesn't come from non-living materials. doesn't happen, never has, never will. That's a scientific law, by the way, that has to be broken if you're going to accept the theory of evolution. Second, what about the fixity of the species? You can look at the fossil records, you'll find nothing to confirm that one species has ever become another species, never. I mean, it's that simple. The fixity of the species, that's scientific fact that has to be broken if you believe the theory of evolution. I mean, there may be variety in these various species. You have a whole lot of different kind of cats. You have a whole lot of different kind of dogs, but cats don't become dogs and dogs don't become cats. It doesn't happen. Fixity of the species. Just a little common sense taken with the scripture. Or what about design demands a designer? I have a watch here. Did not come about through an explosion in a watch factory. Didn't happen. No, has a design behind it. You see, all things that have design had a great designer behind it. That's scientific fact that has to be broken if you accept the theory of evolution. But people reject the creation account. Why? Despise God. These Pharisees rejected what the man said for what reason? Despise Jesus. Can't accept that. But here's a man who's not caught up in that. He's just a simple commoner who was born blind. He says, I don't know who he is. I don't know much about him. All I know is that while I was once blind, I now can see. Now you find the inspiration, don't you, for that beautiful hymn we were singing earlier by John Newton. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Here's a man who could have sung that song better than any could have ever sung that song because he is the one who said, Oh, I was blind, but now I can see. Then they said to him again, What did he do to thee? How did he open your eyes? Verse 26. He answered them and said, I've told you already, and you would not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Now I like this. Will you also be his disciples? <laughs> Why are you so interested in what I'm saying? Do you want to know more about him so you can be one of his disciples? That cut them to the heart. Oh, they're getting angry now. I mean, they, are, they despise this man because here's just a, a man who's a, who's a simple man, a common man, who's, be able, who's being able to throw truth right back to them, and they can't handle it. They can't, they can't answer it. And so the text says in verse 28, then they reviled him. 
and said, Thou art his disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. Oh, you're not Moses' disciples. Jesus took care of that back in John chapter 5. Jesus said, If you were Moses' disciples, then uh, you'd listen to Moses. He wrote of me, uh, but you don't listen to Moses. You don't listen to Moses. You don't consider his writings. Why would you listen to my words? No, you don't know Moses. If you, know, if, if you knew Moses, you'd know me. He spoke of me. He believed in me. They say, we know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes? Here is something marvelous that's taken place, and yet you know so very little about it. Think about this just for a moment, he says. Don't you know that God heareth not the prayers of a sinner? Oh, that's, an, that's, a, that's a truth from the Old Testament, isn't it? Don't you know that God heareth not sinners? Any man who's indifferent to God, who's separated from him, God doesn't hear him. Oh, no, he doesn't hear him, but if a man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. And so, since the world began, he says, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Now, here's their response. It is said in spite, filled with hatefulness, it says, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? All oh, these intellectually superior folks, they then cast him out. <laughs> when you read those words, and they cast him out, here's what it means. He won the debate, right? He won the debate. Oh, if they had an edge on him, they'd have kept him there. But all they could do was just cut him down, speak evil of him, and then throw him out. Guy in Woods was perhaps, along with Brother Hardiman, the premier debater of the last century. Brother Guy in Woods said, I always knew when they started attacking my bald head, I won the debate. <laughs> and so it is that this simple man had won the debate. And they cast him out. Now, where's Jesus been all this time? <laughs> you think Jesus knows what's going on here? Sure he does. But I'll tell you, sometimes Jesus just lets you stand on your own two feet. He's close by. But Jesus knew what this man did, and don't you know he had to smile? I'm sure that Jesus didn't like the fact that this man had to suffer from the Pharisees, but Jesus could say to this man, join the club. I've been dealing with these Pharisees since the beginning of my ministry. But it says in verse 34, rather the verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Now, I don't know what else Jesus was thinking. I'm sure Jesus took great pride in how this man handled the situation. But remember, he's bringing him to conversion. You see, there's some folks that need correcting. That's the disciples. There's some things they still didn't understand, some things we still don't understand. And through the years, we study and we learn and we grow and we mature and we are able to come to a better understanding. Uh, the Lord's patient with us, isn't he? Then there are those who absolutely reject what the Lord has said. That's the Pharisees. Then there's this man who has a heart that's willing to be converted. And Jesus says, do you believe on the Son of God? He said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said, thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. By the way, friends, if you ever have any struggle whatsoever worshiping Jesus, there's your authority to do so. You've heard it said, but well, you come to the assembly, you know, you worship God the Father. No, no, you can worship Jesus. There it is. You remember when, when Cornelius tried to worship Peter? Peter said, you get up. I too am a man. Jesus didn't respond that way. Here is a man who worshiped at the feet of Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He accepted the worship. He's God in the flesh. He accepted his worship. He said, I believe. And he worshiped him. And then verse 39, For judgment I am come into this world, so says Jesus, that they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? 
Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. None so blind that refuse to see, right? That's these Pharisees. All of the intelligence, all of the opportunity that they had, and yet still rejected the Christ. But a common man who was born blind gladly accepted the Lord's teaching, humbled himself before his Savior, and received that which he offered. That man who was born blind, very epitome of the one for whom Jesus came to rescue. You remember on one occasion, Jesus would say, uh, I came not to call sinners, or came not to, to call the righteous, but rather sinners to repentance. You see, the whole, they don't need a physician, Mark 2, 17. I came to call the sinner, not the righteous. Lord, are you saying these Pharisees are righteous? No, they think they're righteous. And because they think they're righteous, and because they think they're religious, and because they think they're exceptional, he says they cannot be saved. They're really still blind. Oh, you could not have offended these Pharisees anymore by saying, you're blind, you can't see. But they were. It brings to my mind the profound truth stated by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. For ye see your, bre your calling, brethren, that not many wise men after the flesh are called, not many mighty, not many noble. None of them are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the, the weak things of the world to confound the mighty. And base things and things which are despised hath God chosen and things which are not. To do what? To bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That truth is seen over and over and over again, generation after generation, that those who seem to me the most intelligent, the most powerful, the most gifted, refuse what the Savior offers. And thus, Jesus says, they are really the blind ones. They are really the ones who cannot see. That should not be found in any of us. Remember what Jesus stated Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There at the very opening of the Sermon on the Mount, humility is what it takes. And this man, born blind, was found with great humility. So this morning I ask, have you, have you had your sight restored? You say, oh, Brother Grider, I can see clearly. Can you? Can you see clearly? I'm talking about something else, something that's much more profound Jesus opened the eyes of this man who was born blind, but he can open our spiritual eyes and will through the light of his word. Be like that blind man. Have a humble heart. Open your eyes to the truth of the gospel and be saved. That's what you have to do. Jesus still says, I am the light of the world. He came to save. That's exactly right. And so, have you accepted his invitation for pardon and for remission of sins? You can do that if you'll be humble enough to accept it. Penitent believers, confess Jesus, be baptized for the remission of your sins. Won't you do that today or either be restored to your first love and do so now as we stand and sing.